Um, but I get to start off my sermon today with something that I absolutely love to do. It's one of my favorite things to do in the world, and that is repent. I get to apologize. Uh, I'm a little bit like, um, I'll, I don't like, I take personal responsibility for things. That's one of my things. But it's my mom's fault. <laughs> because I've got her filter system, and they're, that's just non existent. It just, whatever comes in, just whoop. And I don't know, maybe none of you caught it last week. I didn't get any mean emails or anything like that. But I said something last week. And then as I was praying, immediately I felt a check in my spirit. Do you guys ever feel that check in your spirit when you're like, either you're about to do something wrong or you just did something wrong and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit's like, ooh, are you sure? Uh, that probably wasn't the greatest of ideas. And I just, I just moved on very quickly because we were in that part of the service where uh, we just wanted to move on. But... I said something last week that, you, you know, the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not some weird mist, or he's not a cloud, or he's not, he manifests himself in many different ways, but he's part of the trinity of the person of God. And just like you and I, the Holy Spirit can be grieved. He can be hurt. And so I said something last week in the attempt to uh, make people feel uh, like they could respond in a way, and I said I'll just tell you just what I said. I said, you can come up and no one's going to shaba over you. Anybody catch that? Yeah. Was anyone mad? Yeah. Pablo, you were mad? No, you weren't mad. I never want to make the fruit of the Holy Spirit something that isn't weighty and heavy. And I never want to make you think that we take lightly the work of the Holy Spirit because we don't. There are times when people from outside of our congregation come in, and we are a Bible-believing congregation. One of the things we believe is if it's in the Word, it should be in us. We believe in signs, wonders, miracles. We believe in the fruit of the Spirit. We believe in the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We believe in speaking in tongues is a, uh, is a gift that God gives. We believe in prophecy. We believe in the different levels of ministry. We believe all of those things and all those things should be in us and we don't take lightly any one of those things. And what I was trying to do last week, my heart was right, but my wording just wasn't right. I wanted to let people know that this is a safe place where we will come and we'll pray for you. We will give you encouragement. But if the Lord ever gives someone a word in tongues or, or a, 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 they just feel the, the unction of the Holy Spirit pressing them to speak out, in a language that we don't understand that's heavenly, but I know it's biblical. I mean, no, you don't always have to understand everything for it to be biblical. Then we never want to deter that, and we never want to back away from that, because we absolutely love the Holy Spirit and his work. And I don't know if it's possible to shut down part of the Holy Spirit without shutting down or grieving all of the Holy Spirit. And I never want to live in that place. So as your pastor, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Perfect. I don't. All right. Now on to the sermon today. We are in a season where things are going quickly and, and we're excited about what God's doing here. Um, and as we were thinking about the things and seeing some of the exciting things going on, I, I got to thinking about, um, about some of the words that God has spoken over this church. And, you know, Pastor Melanie, when she was here, she was the keeper of the words. She has this book that's about this thick with, like, every word that was spoken over this church from, from forever. How long were you guys here? A long time. So she, it's, she has all of these words, and she keeps them, and she prays over them, and, she, and she, uh, she speaks into those things. And as I was thinking about some of those words, like, like we're to be an oasis, we're to be um, a place where, where pastors and ministers can come and be refreshed and then be sent out again. We're, we're, we're called to be a hospital where people, the, the hurting and broken, can come and, and, and be healed, but they don't stay here, they go out. We're to be a sending church. Um, all of these things, which are amazing words, and, and I know that in those words, there are some that just we haven't seen yet. We haven't seen the fullness of what God wants to do in us and through us here at Abundant Life. How many of you are glad that God isn't done with us yet? 
I, I really believe that his word, when his word says he does nothing without first revealing it to his servants, the prophets, I believe that means that he doesn't do anything without first revealing it to his servants, the prophets. I know it's complex. It's hard to understand. But God gives men and women words and, and understanding and revelation so that we can walk and step into these amazing and wonderful things that he has for us. And if we shut off the voice of the prophet, we shut off the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us, then we shut off our future and our destiny. Do you understand that? Because how many of you know when it says God does nothing, that means he doesn't do anything? The Hebrew word for that is nothing. So my question becomes this, I, I, we, I know we have all of these amazing things and wonderful things and I don't want to just like go out of there and step outside of who I am and who I feel like we are right now in this moment to, to like go after those things but at the same time I'm like God I know that you said this, I don't know exactly how it fits but I know that you said this and I believe that you're going to fulfill it. I believe that you're going to in your timing and in your season you're going to begin to do those things and then I was thinking about my personal life and some of you can think about your walk with God. How many times have you thought you know what, I know that God has something better than what I'm in right now. I know that he promised me some things and I'm just not seeing it. I know that God has said that, that his promises are yes and amen. I know that his plan is to prosper me, not to harm me, but I am not walking in prosperity at this moment. You know, there's a lot of personal factors that go into that. Last week I talked about uh, the, the, the power of personal responsibility, the power of preparation, the power of, of, of hope and expectation, expecting that God is about to release and do the things that you know that he's promised. I talked about that last week, and today I'm going to go just a little bit further in that same avenue, and I want to talk about your own dreams and your own visions and the dreams and the visions of this church and, and where God is taking you, because how many of you know that Things that are alive and healthy tend to grow. And I'm not talking in numbers. I'm talking in depth. I'm talking yes in numbers. I'm talking in, in expansion of the kingdom of God. I'm talking about in reputation. Anything that has life and is good and is healthy is going to grow. Correct? So it's not a question of is this the promise of God. The question is, is this the timing of God? And oftentimes we have issue with God's timing. Oftentimes we question the promise because of the timing. And I want to encourage you today. Does anyone here ever do that? Does anyone ever question the timing of God? Have you ever been on the journey of life and you know that what God has said, but you, and you know what he's promised, but it's not just what you're living in and what you're seeing right now? Does it ever cause you to question or doubt the thing that you've heard. I would like to say that I have perfect trust in God and that I've never questioned him, but I can't because I don't want to repent again next week. That's like a once a month thing that I like to do. And that's it. That's a joke. But I really feel like in order for us to understand the promises and the revelation of God to see the things that he's called us to be as a church and you as an individual, I think you have to, come, I have to, you have to bring all of those promises and prophecies and revelations, you have to bring those into the context of time. And I want to explain that to you today. And I want you to go to uh, the book of uh, Habakkuk. In Spanish, it's Habakkuk. In Italian, it's Habakkuk. I don't know any of that to be true. Just saying it. I'm just waiting for you to get there. On my, in my Bible, it's page 1436. But it says this, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry.
There is no questioning the promises of God. But we live in time. And what is time to someone who knows the beginning and for the end, who was and is and will be to come? What is time? I know the promises of God are good. I know the promises of God are yes and amen. But how does that relate to in this life I will have trouble? You see, it takes time. And one of the things during the time and the preparation and the call for patience and the need for the need for like this verse says the need for the waiting and the need for the appointment of the vision it takes time for a vision it takes time for provision it takes time for revival it takes a certain time for blessing to come through And before you see the material, there's always the revelation and there's always the word. Before you see some things come to pass, there has to be a trust in the thing that he said. Do you understand that? Now, I preached a sermon once and we talked about how there's all of these things like the speed of sound and there's the speed of light and there's, there's uh, you know, all of these things that are that are provable and instantaneous and these things are measurable and as human beings we are comfortable with something that can be measured right like that is an absolute the speed of light the speed of sound that is an absolute correct as we live unless God changes something the sun's going to come up tomorrow well the sun doesn't really come up we're going to rotate and we're going to see the sun rise. And we're going to see the sun set. And I can tell you the exact second in time because my weather app will tell me that. Because somebody smarter than me was able to measure that. And I feel good. I feel good about that. I'm comfortable with that. The promise of God is yes and amen. The timing of God is not entirely measurable. So the question is, what do you do in the time of the process? How do you react in the process? How do you react in the time of waiting? And Habakkuk, it, 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 it's this amazing, amazing, just remember, it's, it's, it's this amazing uh, uh, scripture that just encourages you that yes, this is the promise of God. Yes, it may not be what you see in front of you, but wait expect live in this hope because the last thing to change is always all these measurements of natural laws they bind us we cannot change them but the fact of the matter is god is not he is not that's a that's a very tough statement god is not He can be if he chooses to be, but that's, never mind. We're not going to get into all that today. He is not hindered by space and time. God is not hindered by our time. He created time for us. He created day and night for seasons and for times. But he lives outside of that realm. He can work inside of it, but he lives outside of that. He is the beginning. He is the end. We're affected by time. But his promises and his revelation and his spirit, and is this just, or are you guys understanding this? You getting this? Oftentimes we are frustrated and we're angry and we're, we're like, God, what are you doing? What's the, and we begin to question God and we begin to question the promise. My whole goal in this is understanding that his promise that came from outside of time is for us and it is yes and it is amen. It is our job to hold on to that promise, cultivate that promise, to sow into that promise, to see it fulfilled while we're here among the living. And the Holy Spirit is part of this process. You see, he is God of, of the created, but he's not bound to it as we are. He sees the beginning from the end and operates outside of our understanding because he knows all and is all and, is, and through all came into being. 
But we have, we have, like, we have this tool called the Holy Spirit, and he's, he's this person, and he's in us, and he works through us, and he is the, he is the uh, revelation of God on this earth that, that through him and in him we abide, we, we have our being, we're, 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 made, we're given revelation, all of these amazing and wonderful things. And if we live according to the Spirit, we live in this place, then we're able to fulfill, we're able to walk into the promises that God has created. But I believe that there's a key in the Bible. I believe there's a key to unlocking the promises of God in your life. Would you like to know what it is? How many of you have a promise of God in your life that you haven't seen fulfilled yet? How many of you, you do not have a promise from God? I'll give you one right now. Okay, good. But for us to to enjoy the manifestation here on this earth while we're living, we have to trust that it is coming. And I want to take you to 1 Kings chapter 18 for a moment. I'm all Old Testament today. You guys okay with that? And I'm going to read a couple verses, and I'm, going to, I'm just going to tell you the story, but I'm going to read a couple verses. And this first verse, 1 Kings chapter 18, it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Okay. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we find a prophet named Elijah. And in the time of Elijah, there was a king that rose up. And this king was, he was not a good leader. He allowed the the prophets of Baal and and, um, of some other gods to come in. And they were the leaders of the religious, uh, they were the religious leaders of the time. Instead of relying on God and the prophets of God, he actually, his have anybody heard of Jezebel? Yeah, that was his woman. Okay, they were together. And so Ahab and Jezebel, they were, uh, Jezebel was killing all the prophets of God, finding them wherever. Uh, there were some men of God that, that hid a hundred prophets in these caves, 50 in each cave. And so they were walking through this process. But during that time, God put a, uh, a sin of drought over, the, over the, uh, the nation of Israel. There was no rain. There was nothing. It was just like super dry time. But after years of famine in the midst, not only of natural famine, but of spiritual famine, understand that there was a natural famine. There was no rain. There was nothing. But also, because they had taken away all the prophets of God, there was no word of God in that time. There was no worship. There was, no, there was nothing. So there was a spiritual famine as well. And after, after, a, after a time with no indicator that, that God was moving, Elijah declared in 1 Kings chapter 18, he got this word and he says, get up. And I will send rain on the earth. Now it's important to know, I think, in, in that time, God didn't give him the plan. He just said, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Now go do this, 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 this. No, he said, listen, I need you to go talk to Ahab and I'm going to go send rain on the earth. So he knew that he had to do something. How many of you know the promises of God require action? I've seen too many people get a promise from God or a prophecy or something and said, well, God said this. So they just sit back and they're like, okay, I'm ready. God, you called, me, you called me to be an evangelist. All right, here I am. Bring me the people. Oh, God, you've called me into the nations. You've called me into the earth. Perfect. I need the money to do it. And they sit and they wait. Can I tell you that there isn't a promise of God that doesn't require action from you? Because it requires partnership. He is the God of your free will. He is not the God over your free will. He allows you to make choices, and he sets before you this awesome promise, and the choices that you make get you to the place that he's promised. Hi, you in the back, I see you now. I was sitting, now I'm standing. I don't know if you can still see me. Thanks, Corey, short joke. 
I, he got a laugh from it, so I thought I'd try to. Listen, when he said this, there was no physical sign. There was no, all he had was a promise and a job. There was no physical sign, yet Elijah knew that the word of the Lord surpasses the understanding of the physical. It surpasses everything. It had not happened. His faith was greater than his doubt, and his expectation far outweighed his fear. Elijah labored in prayer fervently, according to 1 Kings chapter 42, six different times for rain. He had cried out to God and prayed for God and fasted and asked God, God, please send your rain. But nothing happened, no rain. And yet by faith, he commanded his servant, get up, look again, for I've heard the sound of abundance of rain. I didn't get there yet. Hold on. So he gets this word in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. He goes to the king and he says, hey, king, I need to talk to you. How long, will you, how long will you go between two gods? You have your prophets and you have your Jezebel and she's doing all these things. She's killing the prophets of God and yet we are living in this, in this famine spiritually and physically. So he said, I have, a, I have something that I want to do. Now, I don't see anywhere else that God told him to do this. I don't see him say, go get up, go talk to Ahab and say, hey, I, I want to... I want to have a showdown with all your prophets. No, he just said, go tell them that there's, that there's abundance of rain. How many of you know after, four, after, after however many years of famine and rain, if someone tells you, hey, there's going to be rain, you're going to listen? He said, this is what I want you to do. We're going to call everyone over to Mount Carmel, and, and I want your prophets to come, and, my pro- and I'm going to be there. And whoever's God answers with fire, that's who we're going to serve. Now, Ahab didn't have anything to lose here. Okay, he was, he, he'd been looking for Elijah to try to kill him anyway. And he's like, okay, meet me here. Sounds good to me. So the prophets of Baal get up there, they're cutting themselves and they're doing all these things. They're trying to get God answered by fire. Obviously, it doesn't happen. This is all in the same chapter, 1 Kings chapter 18. And in verse 30 is where I want to go. It says, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two whatever of seeds. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, and laid it on the wood, and said, Fill your water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Just remember, they were in a famine where there was no water. And he's saying, Hey, I want you to dump water out on the ground, because I'm going to call down fire. That didn't make a lot of sense. There's a different sermon on that, but... Fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, for this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord is He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and executed them there. This is a fun story. I think they should make a movie. So God says, Go to Ahab. I'm about to send rain. He gives the promise. Elijah listens. He goes to Ahab while he's with Ahab. It turns out that they set up a showdown. God wins. Woohoo! It was a nail biter. And immediately from that place, Elijah said to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the abundance of rain. You see, through everything, through all of this, Elijah understood that the promise of God was there. He walked out some things. He walked out this, this amazing, amazing uh, his, part of history 
where, where Israel is turning its heart back to God. And immediately he goes back to the promise. Now, Elijah could have just stayed in that place. It was a good place. It was, he was the hero. All the prophets of Baal were dead. Things were going well. But then he went up to the mountain, and Elijah said to, and, and he went up and looked and said, there is not, oh, sorry. He bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go up now, look towards the sea. So he went up and looked, and there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again. Then it came to pass the seventh time that he said, there is a cloud, as small as a man's hand, rising out of the sea. So he said, go up, say to Ahab, Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was a heavy, heavy rain. See, Elijah... Elijah had the faith to say, get up and look again. On the seventh time, Elijah should return with a different report. I don't know how many times you've gone before the Lord and said, hey, this is what you said. This is not what's happening. This is what you said. This is not what's happening. What happens if Elijah would have quit and just said, okay, I don't see it, so it must not be there. But he said there's something different this time. When he came back the seventh time, he said there's something different. Now it's, it's not rain, but there's a little cloud about the size of a man's hand. How many of us in our lives and as we're walking out this promise, I'm just, there's little tidbits through all of this and then I'm going to get to a main point, but how many of us we see bits of the promise, but sometimes we miss them because we're not really looking. We say, God, that's not the, the big thing you promised. He said, yeah, but it's, it's part of it. It's an opportunity to step in. It's an opportunity to go further. It's an opportunity to trust in me a little bit. I'm showing you a glimmer of hope. You see, Elijah knew the promise of God. And when he saw that glimmer of hope, he said, that's it. He said, that's, that's it. In the middle of his struggle, in the middle of his circumstance, in the middle of not seeing the promise, he got promised rain and he ended up killing a, a ton of people. Killing a ton of people wasn't the promise. Fighting the, the, the uh, going to Ahab and ended up fighting the, 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 the prophets of Baal, executing them all, wasn't the promise. It was just an added bonus for him. Old Testament's weird. But I love it. That didn't offend the Holy Spirit. He said, kept telling his, his servant, get up, go again, get up, go again, get up, go again, get up, go again, get up, go again. I know what God said, go again. What's your perseverance like? in the midst of struggle, in the midst of things that you don't think are right? What's your per perseverance like? It's easy to quit. It's easy to lay down. It's easy to just sit back and say, God, will you promise this? Now make it happen. It's something different to have to work for something and trust in something that you're not seeing on a continual basis or not even seeing hope of. But I'm going to tell you, there will be a time in your life when you see hope of the promise if you keep on. And when you see the hope of the promise, when you see the glimmer of the promise, it's time to get up. It's time to run. You've had words over your life that you're going to be in ministry and all of this, and you, know, you haven't seen it, and things are going poorly for you. You have words over your life that that, you know, I know that God wants to bless my business, you know, I know that God wants to bless my marriage, I know that God wants to, you know, bring my kids back home, and, and, and you just sit there, and, and you get frustrated, and you get angry, I'm going to tell you, stand up, go look, because God is always working. He's just waiting on us to see that glimmer and saying, okay, now's the time, let's do it, let's go, let's go, let's go. Every promise comes with a call. And just because we don't see 
the fullness of the promise. He's calling us to get up with all faith and look again. The key to seeing the promise fulfilled is trusting in the timing of God and continuing to expect the fulfillment of the promise. See, if we live in expectation, then everything looks different. If I know what God has said about my life, if I know that God is calling me, I know that God has good things for me, then I live in that expectation. Whenever I see something, I, I'm called to bless him. I'm called to praise him. I'm called to worship him. I grow. I continue on this journey. It's life-giving. It becomes this continual process where I'm growing and he's pouring into me and I'm growing and, and we're going after something. get questions a lot of, you know, I see, I don't get questions because the people who are living in this don't usually come and talk to me, but I see people all the time getting tired or frustrated with, whether it's with church or with their personal walk or with what's going on in their life and bored with the journey that God has them on. I would say, listen, you're just not doing it right. You're not seeing God do amazing things in, in your life. You're not seeing the promise fulfilled. You're not seeing a glimpse. Listen, you're not doing it right. Because I know his promises. You know his promises. Are you living and expecting to see them come to pass? If not, I want to challenge you today. It's time to get up. It's time to go look. When's the last time you went and you revisited that promise and you said, God, what are you doing in this? It's easy to live your life in frustration saying this isn't happening. It's, it's another thing to go ask God, God, what are you doing? How can I partner with you in this thing? How can I expect greatness in this thing? He went back to the promise, get up, for I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. In just a moment, I'm going to show you this video that it gets me jacked up every time I watch it. It gets me excited, I get pumped up, I get like, I'm ready to go conquer the world. But after this video shows, I want to, I'm going to just take two more minutes and I want to ask you a couple questions. And I want to challenge you before you leave this place. Because I believe in the promise that God has given you. But I know that every promise comes with a job. And if we're not willing to do the task, if we're not willing to walk it out, that's not on him. It's on us. Because we have responsibility. So I want you to watch this video and be good. The question becomes, what do you see? What do you see? When you're, when you're hurting and struggling and when you're, when you're questioning the promise, what do you see? Because God's always working. He's always doing something. It's our job to look again. And to go back and look again. And to, and, and to go back and look again. And no matter what we feel, no matter how frustrated we get and no, how, how impatient we get, we understand that he works outside of our time, but you know the promise and you know that your job is to believe and to trust and to know that, is, that, that, that if he said it, he wants you to walk in it. And I encourage you today, I, you have to go and revisit the dreams that God has placed in your heart. You see, the callings of God are irrevocable. That's, it's, it's scriptural. The callings of God are irrevocable. The thing that he's spoken over your life saying, listen, I know that I have this for you. He said it. It's absolute truth. You say, well, I'm not walking in it. Well, that's not his fault. I always say that God does a really good job of his portion of our relationship. If there's ever an issue with my relationship or my calling or my passion, it's not because God is withholding it from me because he's a really good God who does a really good job with his portion of our relationship. But there's two in this thing. And he's calling us to partner with him and walk with him and run with him and believe in him. And I, and I, I have to ask myself this question when I read this story and when I'm, I'm speaking things like I'm talking about today. What if? What if Elijah, when God told him, listen, I want you to go to Ahab because I'm about to send the rain, what if he 
What if he looked back on the last three years of drought and he said, you're not sending rain. Ahab is killing. He is looking for me because he wants me dead. You see, there was every reason to not go to Ahab. But one reason for Elijah to go was enough, and that's that he had heard the sound of rain and God spoke a word. Do we trust more in the word of God? And the thing that he's spoken over your life, or do you trust more in the circumstances and the things that you've seen maybe for years in your life? Or do you believe that he's sending his rain? Do you believe that he gave you a promise? Maybe you don't understand it fully, but what if Elijah didn't understand it? What if he, what if he didn't go? I don't know, maybe, maybe there wouldn't have been rain. Maybe God would have used another way to, to restore his people. But man, Elijah is a champion because of this story. He did a lot of other cool things, but you remember Elijah because of this story. Would God have called another? Here's another question. Did God send the rain because of Elijah's faith? And that's important because here's the deal. You have no idea what your promise holds. You have no idea. You have no clue about the things that God has spoken over your life. What, in, in the perfect timing, in His will, and, and when He releases it, you have no idea of the expanse of what your promise holds. You see, this promise was, was to Ahab. until I, He said, go tell Ahab that I hear rain. He didn't say, go tell all of Israel. He said, go tell the leader that I hear the sound of rain and see what he says. See what he does. Elijah set out to, to, to affect one human and the, and the a whole nation was brought back to, Jesus, to, to, to God, the Father. See, we think our promises are for us. Listen, no, he doesn't release anything just for you. He releases it to, for, the, for the expansion of his kingdom. What could happen if happen if we would begin to dream and begin to look outside of ourselves? Corey, what would happen if God just came in and gave you a word and, and all your dreams just were released right now? Shirley, what would happen? Brad, what would happen if God just answered your prayers right now and this was his timing? See, I don't know the timing of God, but all I know is that I have a responsibility. And if I, if I live up to my responsibility in the promise, then I know that it will come. Hope what will happen if. Bob, what would happen if? Carlos, what would happen if your promise was released? Josh, what would happen if your promise was released? Steve, what would happen? Tyler, what would happen? Caleb, what would happen? Brock, what would happen if? It wouldn't be just about you. It would be about a city and about a nation and about a family coming together, being lifted up, being restored because the promise is never for you. It's for, it's for everyone around you. It's for your children and your children's children. It's for a legacy. You do not know what your promise holds, and it's not your job to know. It's your job to listen, to believe, and to go look. Because you can't make it rain. What is in your hands? What do you have the power over? You have the power to listen, and you have the power within you to believe. You can't make it rain. I trust the one who can make it rain. You see, the, your promise could change history. Elijah's promise changed history. One word to Elijah changed history. Go tell Ahab. Change the history of an entire nation. 
Your promise could change your family. It could change your future. It could change your children. It could change your children's children. It could leave a legacy. It could change a city. It could change the heart of a nation. The promise wasn't, I'm going to restore Israel. The promise was, I'm going to send rain. God did the rest. It's time to go look again. It's time to revisit your passion. It's time to revisit your promise. I'm going to live in expectation and hope and faith that we serve a good and loving God and that I, I'm looking for a cloud somewhere. I'm looking for just the, li- the smallest glimpse and I'm going to run with it. I want everyone in here for just a moment. I want you to think about, think about your promise. The thing that God spoke to you, the thing that you know he has for you, the thing that that you heard, you know you heard him speak. If you've never received a promise from God, I just pray right now you would just open your heart and he's going to release a promise over your life, whether it's for you, whether it's for your family. I don't know what it's going to be about. For just a moment, think about it. For some of you, just thinking about it brings a level of frustration. Some of you, you've lost all hope in the situation. Some of you in this place, you just, all you've done is question the timing of God. And that produces something in your life and in your heart that keeps you from stepping out and going after. Some of you say, listen, I went after this thing and, and, and it hurt me. I got burned by trying to go after this. Did you see a cloud or were you going and trying to make a cloud? Was it your timing or his timing? I'm going to tell you that he works outside of our time. He works outside of our understanding. But your responsibility is to listen, to believe, and to go look again. Are you willing to go look again? Are you willing to continually, on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, whenever you're reminded of what God has spoken over your life, are you willing to look around you and say, God, what are you doing in this? You have a responsibility within the promise. And I want to challenge you today not to take lightly the promise that God has placed on your heart because it is not about you, it is about your family. And it's about our city. And it's about a nation. It's about your future. And it is attainable because he promised it. Because he said, that's enough. Because he said it, that's enough. Amen? Can you say that? Because he said it, that's enough. Come on, say it in your own heart. If he said it, so that's enough for me. I said it before, every call takes action. Every promise requires action and personal responsibility. If you're ready to take action for your promise today, I want to do this. I just want to pray over you. If you would, if you're ready to take action, if you know the promise God has placed over your life and you're saying, I'm going to go after it with everything I have because I know that if, 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 if all of us go after our promise, 
There is no stopping the kingdom of God in this city, in this nation. It only took one to change an entire nation. What can God do when his, when his heart is for us and we partner with that in the promises that he's placed in us? What can happen? Anything. What can stand against us? Nothing. If you're ready to go after the promise of God, stand up. I want to pray for you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the promises in this room. I thank you for the calls in this room. Father, I thank you that they go far beyond generations to come. Father, I thank you that even now you are releasing new promises. Father, we declare in this place that we, we are a people who will listen for your voice. And when we hear, Father, we will be quick to obey, to go after. Father, not to, not to lose heart in the, in the timing of the process, not to lose heart in the, in the timing of the promise, but Father, we will stand diligently and seeking after, Lord God, the cloud, even just the smallest glimpse of what you're doing. And Father, we stand and we say, we trust you today. And we, some of us, God, we repent for losing hope in the promise. We lay it, we lay down our own insecurities, our own failures, our own fears, God, and we take on, we take on, we wear the promise that you've placed over our lives. Just like, just like Joseph wore the promise. Father, we take on, we put on the promises of God over our lives. Through struggles, circumstances, it doesn't matter what we see, we say yes to what you have for us. Now, before we leave, I want you to do one thing, just one more thing. I know I, this is like number, thing number three, but one more thing. What can you do right now, today? If God says, I'm going to restore your family, who do you need to text? Who do you need to call? If God says, I'm, I'm putting you out there to, to, to minister, what can you do today to do that? Who can you go find to minister to today? If God says, listen, I, I, I'm bringing your relationship with your kids closer together. I'm restoring your kids. What can you do today? You can do something. What is your promise? And what can you do right now? Instead of sitting back and wait for it, how can you proactively seek the promise? Because I, I know one thing. When I go after what God said to go after, he comes alongside. He came so alongside Elijah. Elijah to fulfill his word. His promises is never for you to fail. His promises is always for you to succeed. Amen? So when you go from this place today, you need to do something that, ha that relates to your promise, that gets you closer to your promise. And then tomorrow when you wake up, you say, Holy Spirit, what can I do today to get me closer to my promise? And I guarantee you, when you partner with God in the promises that is his life, you will see drastic changes in relationships, in your family, in, in, in your workplace, in your business, whatever it is, I promise you, because his, 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 his promise for your life is good. It's not for you to fail. It's not for you to fall on your face. It's not for you to, to walk in, in unbelief or in anger or frustration, okay? Can you do that? God bless you as you go today. Uh, go out and do something amazing. Amen? All right.